if you have been watching my channel for any amount of time, you know that I like to bring up some books, some blues books, some of them kind of conventional. Remember this one? The Lomax look at thing, kind of sy sympathetic. Let's leave it at that. We've got the David Evans book, which is driven by academia. And then we've got George Mitchell's book where he's kind of like calling out that sympathetic stuff. Doesn't cut it with George Mitchell. Anyway, you know that I like blues. I like old blues records. I like uh, the Samuel Charter stuff from the uh, this series, the Jazz Library. <laughs> they are not jazz, but Sleepy John Estes, Furry Lewis. This is the kind of stuff I like. And if I can find an artist that can play uh, renditions of this stuff. I love the North Mississippi All-Stars. Uh, going to Brownsville, you'll find that one on a Furry Lewis album. Stuff like that. But if I can find somebody that can play this stuff close to its original form, then I'm going to like that a lot. And So here's the story. I found somebody. I've been giving you little hints about this person uh, on my Instagram and in these episodes, but I found somebody which caused me, once I knew that they were coming here into town, to string up the Galliano junk pile and hunt them down and get them to play it a little bit. And you'll see some of that footage from a show in LA at the Peppermint Club where I got a few minutes and we focused on playing the guitar and the music. In this episode, we're going to focus on a few other things, and I got the interview of a lifetime because, face it, guys, when I go talk to an artist, I don't have a label. Y'all are my loyal subscribers, but I'm not selling you anything. I'm not trying to sell guitars, any of that kind of stuff. And outside of my channel, those of you that know me pretty well or look my name up on the Internet have found out I work as a public servant for a municipality that has pretty high expectations and I also sit on a school board and public education is very important to me especially turning out kids who know who they are who aren't afraid to follow their potential down the road and anything we can do to help them get the litter out of the way where they can focus on the purpose of education which is this more education and taking up an adult role that is successful and what's that other word independent that's right with independent being independent comes the ability to look at what you're doing not be dreadful not hate life not feel drudgery and most importantly, not to be looked down upon by others, regardless of what you are, who you are. Now, we're talking about Nat Myers. Nat Myers. If you get on Bandcamp, I'm going to give you a link below. There is a, a, a collection of about five songs. It's got a hat, a yellow background, and a hat like that one up there on it. And in those recordings, Nat got some old uh, 30s and 40s model recording equipment, and you swear you were listening to 78 music. Um, and so once I saw that, I had a vision or heard it. I had a vision in my mind of what this person might look like. First, I was confused that it was modern, that it was recorded in the last year or so. But... Um, I had this idea, okay, this sounds like this, the person is probably this, they look like this, they dress like this, all these preconceived notions about what this means to make me feel comfortable <laughs> in life. 
If that's burning your ears, I'm sorry. You probably got to look in the mirror and find, you know, we can all make some changes. But at the end of the day, I went and found Nat Myers, got a guitar in his hands, played it, and, and the, the best thing about that can happen for me is that guitar is going down the road. It's got a new life somewhere. It is... <laughs> um, it was made in 1940, so you got 60 plus 23. Where I come from, that's 83 years old. We put all kinds of time and effort into it, and now it's going to a new life down the road, and you're going to see that guitar. But the day after I saw Nat uh, play, I was fortunate to sit under a big old oak tree with Tammy and Nat, and have a, a conversation, a good conversation. And we talked about some things like, where did Nat find his roots in the blues? These guitars he plays, they're very seldom electric. They might have a pickup on it to amplify the sound a little bit, but he's into the original stuff. I asked him a few questions about guitars, and we got into some meaty subjects like, how do you keep your authentic self and what made you in the face of fame and touring and be, being promoted and all that? What's that balance look like? Uh, the life balance day to day. Then we hit a big one, implicit bias. That means the things that cause us to have preconceived notion about people and their potential and all that kind of thing. And... Once you see Nat, he's certainly what I thought I heard uh, when I was listening to his music on Bandcamp. And we talked a little bit about what implicit bias has meant to him uh, growing up and being who he is and, and some ideas about how it um, kind of undermines all kinds of things, including music. And then we ended with the blues, the modern blues, where is it going? Get ready. This is a long one. It's an interesting one. And I was never so happy to take Tammy to meet somebody that she'd been listening to on her device. In fact, she's the one who brought me the iPad. And that's how I first found Nat. So let's go have an up close and personal look at a great musician, Nat Myers. You you lay it out. You go go ahead. Play on it. <laughs> Yo, you got you got a good play on that. That's what you're doing, eh? I think, you know, I kind of found Robert Johnson late in terms of if you want to look at, like, you know, a lot of people's, you know, people always talk to me, they're like, oh, John Fahey or John Hammond Jr. or all these cats, man. Like, you know, I ain't listened to a lick. You know, the other day I was up in, uh, I was up in Eugene, Oregon, and they were playing, uh, they were playing John Fahey on the, on the, on the thing. I was like, who's this? And they're like, John Fahey. I was like, I think this is the first John Fahey song I've actually listened and paid attention to. I think, you know, when it comes to my, I, I went deep into the blues real fast. I didn't, I didn't deal with the people, the revivalists. I went straight down into the 78s, man. And, uh, I mean, one of the big ones is Carl Martin. I'm a big admirer of Carl Martin. Um, his, his plan, you know, he was a mandolin player for a lot of his life. And he brings us just like this. I, I think, he, you know, even 100 years later, it brings us like this refreshment to the instrument that you don't really find too often. And, you know, another one's Robert Petway. I really love Catfish Blues, you know, like a lot of people, but all of Robert Petway's uh, pieces. And, you know, very recently, I've always listened to Fred McDowell, but very recently, you know, I, I, 
I, I listen to you know his John Henry, and I, I keep telling myself it's like now if I can play guitar like that, half as good as that. If I can scrape a little gold off that nugget, you know what I mean? Then I think I'd be a little more content. And so, uh, yeah, you know Carl Martin, uh, Carl Martin, you know Sunhouse is also a big one. I think one of the things that I've been really Oh, and Memphis Minnie. I don't. I can't play no Memphis Minnie really, but I mean, she's just absolutely. I think she's one of the most fabulous musicians um, that's ever lived. Um, you know, she cut like you. You you like you like Memphis Minnie, Tammy? We'll take we'll take that as a yes. <laughs> uh, but Memphis Minnie, I think, is one of the those brilliant musicians who um, really kind of brought me into a deeper blues, which is strange because there ain't, there ain't a lot of gals doing, especially the, especially the plucking and playing, you know, from back in the day. There, there is a number of them doing so, it. You know, I really love, you know, I, I love RL and North Mississippi All-Stars, you know, Junior Kimbrough, all Kimbrough's, uh, you know, I, I really love, uh, Cedric Burnside stuff as well. Um, he's, he's doing some really great stuff. And one of the reasons I love Cedric Burnside, you know, his, uh, um, is I'd be trying, it's, it is the, the album while at the same time it does, you know, he, he, he does on this last album, I'd be trying, he does a uh, bird without a feather, you know, the cover of his grandfather's first recorded song. Um, and at the same time, you got songs like, uh, you got songs that ain't necessarily a blues or a traditional blues. And I love, I love that Cedric as well has kind of operated where while he's homage ain't it, man, you know, he's, He's clearly he's clearly a master of the style, but also he's not afraid to operate outside of it. You know, something that always struck me about, um, you know, I, I, I lived with this fellow named Ernie Vega, an absolutely marvelous musician out of New York, um, really, a really master on the on the old style uh, blues guitar, all kind of guitar. And but you know, he told me about the story. I, I ain't too much well read per se. I ain't really I I ain't read Deep Blues by Robert Palmer or nothing like that. You know. Uh, She's like, man, yeah, I'd like to, you know, maybe one day. But I think Ernie, Ernie was interesting because I, I think the blues is, and the way that we perceive the blues is based upon this legacy that I think is kind of, um, you know, it's based upon racial divisions. The only reason, the only reasons, the only reasons you hear blues so much from uh, the the record companies, particularly in the pre-war, is because they didn't think black people wanted to hear nothing but the blues. They didn't think it would sell nothing. But I think what, what it boils down to is, you know, Ernie told me this story. It's like when Robert Lockwood Jr. was asked, like, what, what, did, what did Robert, what did people like hearing Robert Johnson play when he was in town? He didn't say no blues. He said it was, it was this, it was this uh, jazz standard from the 1930s called My Blue Heaven. Um, and... I think that's kind of like a that's a revelatory thing as well to see how that narrative carries over, um, like within blues music. You know, I, I I think as a good example, you know, like we we perceive, you know, you know, R. L. was a hard some bitch. You know, no, no one can dispute that. But we remember we remember the man who we remember the man who was uh, you know who killed somebody in Chicago, not the fellow who raised his family and his grandkids and you know that aspect of his life. That ain't remembered so much. People are enthralled by that. You know, and, and to me, I think that's a, that emphasis, the emphasis that musicians, journalists, um, the historians, the historians, what they place the emphasis on um, is not the full picture of how these artists are. And, you know, you, you can just go back to the adverts that they do for Lead Belly, you know, when Lomax found John Lomax, you know, yeah, John Lomax found Lead Belly, but he weren't no better. You, you read those press releases that he had out you know getting out lead belly and i mean it's it's some of the it's jingoist stuff that you'll read you know what i mean and this perception of the you know this country bumpkin or these these folks who only wear overhauls in the fields you know it's like you, you get this you get this impression from a lot of the the reading and the, the way that these folks write and it it's partially to do i think you know it's a it's racial as well you know you you got a lot of white people speaking for african-american you know narratives and things like that. Whenever I find these, I think one of the, the tragedies, uh, guitar legacies is like, man, I would really love to, you know, unless you're famous, you don't know where these instruments are. I think one of the curious things about vintage instruments is, uh, you know, they oftentimes aren't handed down as perhaps they should be. You know, I, I, I had an honor of being able to uh, meet and speak with this wine music, this absolutely phenomenal musician named Akaika. 
who lives over in Hilo, just outside of Hilo. And he plays on the same Martin guitar that his great grandma played on, you know. <laughs> and I think that's such a rarity. He's like the first person I really met who's been able to hold on to that legacy within his family. And so, you know, it's it's amazing that these instruments are uh, getting built. But I'd also, I'm also curious about like, yeah, what the, uh, what is it called? Just the, the legacy of this thing. Like, who who owned this? You know, what was the family? Who was late? Because this is clearly a played instrument. This thing was played on. So, yeah, man, it's bulky. It's got a lot of weight to it. It reminds me of the era when the, you know, the light strings of today, or you know, the light strings back in the day were heavy gauges back in the day. This is an instrument that's made to put some heavy, you know, some chicken wires on, and you can you can feel it. You can really feel it, man. Um, it's, you know, it's it's got a weight to it and a presentation to it that just don't got the same. Yeah, they don't make they don't make guitars really like this no more, man. Too told. It's just one of the things about playing good blues instruments today is the tax bracket. You can't, you know, you, national guitars used to be thirty six dollars on the Sears Roebuck. You can't get one for less than forty two hundred now. You know that and that. You know the thing. You know I, I know these cats named John, you know John Tavis Willis. There's a number of programs that are trying to instill in the youngins what this blues means, particularly African Americans. Uh, within the african-american community this is y'all's music and this is what you need to buy by but the thing about a lot of the music is you, it's in, in a certain way it's a segregation based upon class where you can no longer access the, these instruments you know and i think that's one of the big tragedies of music generally this uh the unaffordability of being able to express oneself um where even the ability which i think music is a universal thing that's being further and further removed you know what i mean from people's ability to do it um that's something that's always kind of you know continues to trouble me um where the general trend even though there's more want in this country than there ever been but the prices keep going up you know what i mean and i think that's a that's a trend that just got to change i don't know how i know i know people got to get their bottom lines but you know it would be wonderful to see and maybe they do you know but it'd be wonderful to see you know national national's reputation particularly but you know even gibson things like that to to be to be more aware of themselves of presenting these instruments instead of instead of giving the high flyers or get, get you know I, I can't tell you how many people I, I know who's gotten free gibson guitars you know what i mean but a lot of those people already have a hundred guitars you know what i mean and it's like bring, putting these hands in the hands of people who haven't yet been able to find that expression for themselves i think is imminent and it's important and you know like especially when it comes down to like nashville or any of these places you know people want their stuff to be seen and they want it to be presented but you know like you play a show over in pavel kentucky you play a show off the beaten track and you'll you'll find you'll find you'll find people who are true fans of your music and you'll find people who will ride and die with you in a way that the clout chasing is never gonna do, you know. I mean I started out busking, you know. I started out busking and uh, being able to play for folks and actually make money off my music, it's like a, it's so surreal it doesn't seem like a reality yet, you know what I mean? And uh, I think it's a like when it comes to actually playing out and being around folks, by nature, I don't know, I don't know about yourself, but I'm, I'm pretty introverted by my nature. And, uh, so when I like when I go out and interact with folks, it actually takes a lot out of me. You know what I mean? and, and truth told, when I when I get the opportunity to get back home, it just drives me further and deeper into the blues, playing the blues, you know, maybe, maybe feeling the blues too. Um, but I kind of like just. The blues, the blues is my crux, it's my lighthouse, and everything leads me back to it, as long as I keep that in mind. Um, if I had my way, I wouldn't do nothing, I wouldn't get out of nothing, you know what I mean? I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't be interacting with you or nothing like that, I'd just be to myself and my, I call it my Tom Joe hole, you know, just kind of keep it to my lonesome. Um, the journey's been, there's, there's been a lot of positives, for a long time I used to be able to say, I never experienced none of the negative sides of the music business. I don't know about being able to say that no more. Um, but, you know, I, I was on the road with G-Love for a while. You know G-Love? G-Love and Special Sauce? You know, he, I was kind of talking to him about sort of like, you know, what, what your question is about. He told me, he was like, don't ever forget. He's like, when you're out on the road, when you perform in front of people, 
that's the game. And he's like, when you're out on your front porch and you're playing with your friends, with your family, that's why you play this music. And he's like, you always, you always gotta, you always gotta remember that front porch when you're out there because the game, the game can take it out. Of you. And I just always try to remember, you know, even if it, you know, not not that performing folks ain't what I want to do. It's, it's what I've always wanted to do, but. Uh, Especially when it comes to the blues, you hear a lot of people talk about doing this and that for the fans, things like that. But I don't, I don't make this music for no one but my lonesome man. And I think the thing about the blues is that, you know, it's, it, it's that ethos of if you build it, they will come. I think being able to encounter other people who have deeply listened to this music, deeply affected by this music, or perhaps ain't, are deeply affected by something, but ain't heard this kind of music that speaks to that low downness. I think. Um, that's the opportunity that I'm looking for when it comes to playing music. You know, I always tell myself, I, you know, people always talk about pyramids. They promise you big, big, uh, you know, big name things like you know, capital G Grammys or you know, uh, getting you on whatever. And I, I ain't interested in climbing no pyramid, man. I, I ain't interested in climbing up. I, I've always told myself the reason why I play this music is so I can get closer to the bedrock people and the people already in the bedrock. And I just hope I can keep digging. I, I kind of look at blues as like a kind of stump digging, man. You know, it's like a, it's like love. Love's like digging out stumps. You know, uh, playing the blues, you should be getting deeper into the roots rather than trying to climb no tree or climb no pyramid, man. You know, and so that's that's how I kind of look at it. Where I'm just my, I'm just the same person I was two and a half years ago before I hit the road. It's. It's a joy being able to play, and I, I wouldn't wish it nothing else. But you know, live balance, as you mentioned, is kind of out the window right now. You know, uh, and you know as well as I do, you know, the, the most valuable thing we got is time. You know, and uh, just being able to have time for folks. You know, you taking time out of your day with Tammy here it means a lot. Man. You know, I just know it's like the most valuable thing that we got. Cut it short, you know, I, I, I'm on the road this whole time, but I really can't wait to get back home to, to practice some Casey Bill Walden, you know what I mean? And uh, it's, it's an ongoing process, but finding that balance is something that I didn't have in my life before I was on the road. And because, you know, if, I, if I'm not, you know, I, I haven't seen some of my friends who live a mile away from me, you know, in two, three years since the pandemic started. And I think, honestly, touring is kind of, brought me into that awareness because my time's more wanting now it means my time's more valuable and I, I'm yearning to be around the people that give me kind of like my lifeblood when it comes to making this music or just being who I is and just making more it, it gives me opportunity honestly when I'm off the road to make more time and to consider and to be I don't know, just just to actually appreciate the people that I'm around a lot more and um, Tor torn strange, you know, when it, when it, you know, Dan, when, when Dan and Easy Eye kind of reached out to me, you know, when one of the things that he was talking about was like, yo, you can play the old blues anytime you want, but you know, there's no reason not to update yourself and like do your own thing and kind of get out there in a particular way. I come from a, an, I'm an admirer of traditionalists and people who are able to play the records as they is. I don't have the technical skill to, to do so in my opinion. I think, I think, you know, I've got this really great opportunity to present blues music to perhaps like uh, different cats who might ne never been able to really uh, approach it in some way or look at it as something that their dad listened to or their mom listened to or their grandparents listened to. But the opportunity to be able to like play blues as a young man um, and present this music is like, in all honesty, I think it's the punkest stuff you can be doing right now. It's the coolest stuff you can be doing. and. Like when it like, blues is my lighthouse and blues is my, my ship in the night too. And I think so long as I get to play that music, that's what matters to me. And you know, like, like I was saying, you know, Dan was talking about doing something newer, but as the, as the days goes by, as this record's out longer, I find myself going deeper and deeper into the tradition. I think, you, you know, personally in my personal life, you know, I, I go back to a lot of the things I read. And, you know, I was, a big, I was a big lover of Melville for a long time. And Melville always said you need to shake hands with the inmates of all the place one lodges in. And, like, when it boils down to if you're walking down the street, you know, 
I, it's it's crazy. You know, I, I got a you know I was, I was saying I just kind of over here in the the canyon outside of Ogora Hills. You know, people are nicer to their dogs than they is the people around here sometimes. You know, and uh, that's kind of unfamiliar to me being home from Kentucky, where you say good morning to everybody you meet on the street. And I think what it boils down to is like I think you know I don't know about what kind of reminders or what reflex you can teach people who are living their lives, but I buy by myself that I, I look at anybody, whether it be down and out, whether it be up in them hills, whether it be the rich folks or the down home, I think it's, you always gotta look at them people and be like, that can be me. And that is you. All these people around you is you. And I think abiding by anything in this life but a radical empathy is, I think, I don't know, I think it's fatal. It's. It's, it's unfulfillment. I, I think in a, in a certain way, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not too religious, but it's a sin. And especially when it comes to playing the blues or when it comes to playing music, but th I think this abides by anything. Anything that operates by prohibition on who you is or what you do can't abide. And you always gotta, because the thing is, you know, when it comes to blues music, you know, I'm a, I'm a double oxymoron to people, you know, like, People rag on white folks for playing the blues, but I'm, a, I'm an Asian American from Kentucky playing blues music from Mississippi. I'm a, I'm a triple oxymoron to a lot of people. And the thing is, is, anybody who looks at what I'm doing and they're like, oh, he shouldn't be doing that, or that's appropriation, or put, puts us in the box, you know what I mean? Well, all I gotta say is like, well, you know, too bad. You know, it's, you, you ain't gonna stop the music, you ain't gonna stop people playing it, and you ain't gonna stop how people is. And I think you just have to, I don't know, man. You, you just need to shake hands with all the people, one, one, you know, in all the places. I think, I think we operated by that mentality, you know. I, in Yellow Peril, I talk about, you know, I wrote that song with, uh, with Dan and Pat McLaughlin, and at the same time, I think it kind of delves into, you know, the last lines of that song, or, um, you know, or the last four lines of that song, or uh, uh, everywhere I go, somebody's being abused. Uh, um, None of us can win if some of us is born to lose. And what I think is tragic about that statement is that it ain't true. Because pe pe people, people win all the time, people lose all the time. At the same time, it's an ideal that I think should always be aspired for. If I think if we operated by that, a lot of the want in this country would be gone. And people would be able to shake hands across the aisle, whether politically, culturally, um, you know, the different life experiences as human beings. And I think, I don't know. It's just it's just a wanton thing where I, I, I can't convince too many people like of my mentality. But I think it, you know, not sympathy. You know, nobody, you know, no one needs no sympathy. You, you, it's respect and it's empathy as human beings because we all get this life once, and we're all giving each other. You know, e even to rag on each other. You know, treat somebody in an image that um, makes them less than. You're taking time out of your day, the most valuable thing that you got, you know, uh, to take your time to increase the negativity in this world. And I, I just don't, I just don't think that's a life, you know, that, that's a life that I want to lead or I want to reflect. You know what I mean? So, I don't know, you know. And this is this is one of the strange things working with a label. You know, I, you know, I, I have this. Uh, not, I wouldn't say it's a conflict, but it's like, you know, framing me in a certain way. You know, I was just reading like. I don't like reading about myself generally. I, I, I really hate, I really hate, again, like I'm not really into this for the vanity game. Um, and at the same time, I think there's a, uh, right in the compass, I, I think to a certain extent, but there's also this strange, like when it comes to, when it comes to playing blues, you know, I get told, you know, they, they write it into like some of my, some of my bios from Americana Festival, like writing the, writing the story or changing, you know, subverting the normal narrative, things like that. It's like, well, I don't know. I would like to think that. I don't think it's changed too much though, true told. I think there's a lot, there's a lot, of, there's a lot of people talking about it, but when it comes to cashing the check, everybody gets out the bank. You know what I mean? Like when it, when it boils down to it, I think things are still the same. You know, people are still willing to steal your masters. People are still willing to take everything from you and telling you that they're lifting you up. You know what I mean? Uh, I like to think, and what, what's what's a joy to me is like, you know, I, I wrote Yellow Peril. I think kind of out of ignorance, man. And 
in so far as it's it's my own unique experience. I, I wrote that song because at the beginning of the pandemic, like I think a lot of Asian folks, once you started hearing about this thing coming from over east, it's like, yo man, this is gonna be a bad knock for us. Just give just give it a few months, you know what I mean? And uh it turned out it, it was really true it re really is you know especially over here on the coast you know like being in kentucky where i think the kind of the you know what what happens with me and my wife friends come up to me and they're like it ain't so bad here right you know it ain't so bad you know it ain't so bad here you know like you can you can say it ain't so bad here it's like yeah man you know i, I love kentucky I, I you know i i bleed kentucky it's it's the place i want to be at the same time like i've been made to feel like an exile in my own land too and uh, you know, especially over here on the coast, once you start hearing these stories and these tales, uh, people get, you know, especially like, you know, it's, it's mainly it's mainly older cats. But, you know, a lot, of, you know, people picking on Asian people is like a very, very big problem over here. Not not just picking on them, but bowing them in the streets, you know, blindsiding them um, just simply because they're perceived as weaker, as um, less than. And I think playing this song being able to come over here to the coast just generally you know when I when I see when I see other Asian cats in the crowd and like when I when I speak with them it's just like I, I don't want to give myself too much credit but they're just like hey man you know cool for cool for being able to present this um, another thing that always trips me out is like I'm from Kentucky and people always and people always like fascinated I'm like how, how can someone look like you talk like you do and it's just like would you ask that to nobody else you know what I mean and it's just like, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a funny thing, you know. Pe people in Kentucky don't think nothing of it, but when you go, you know, when you go to certain places, it's just like, oh, well, yeah. Obviously, there's Asian people in Kentucky too who were born there, like who grew up there, you know. And I, you know, my my experience as an Asian American, I, I can never I can never hold up a card and be like I can speak for anybody but myself, let alone Asian people. Like I, I have a hard time speaking for myself, but you know, in my opinion, in my opinion. You know, what, what's going on with African-Americans in this country? What's going on with Latina folk? What's going on with anybody who's out here who ain't part of the mainstream? You know, if, you, if you're Italian, even in New Jersey, you still get flack. You know what I mean? And it's like, I think I think anybody who tries to create some sort of dissonance between that shared common experience, so, you know, whether it be, it's a struggle. It's, it's just a, it's a struggle of being American who ain't necessarily accepted by this country generally, you know, uh, it's, it's mind-boggling to me that if my mom had tried to come to this country potentially before the anti-immigration laws against the Asian folks came here, she wouldn't have been able to get in this country. You know what I mean? I know, I know, I know there's, there's certain people I met who live down in Florida, you know, Filipino. They, his, fa his family came over here in the 70s, but his, his extended family tried to come here in the 60s. They couldn't even get in, so he's got a whole family living in Vancouver, Canada. You know what I mean? And... Not a lot of people know what anti, you know, they, they don't even realize that they're anti-Asian immigration laws, anti-Chinese laws, all these kind of things, you know what I mean? So, not a lot of people are even aware of the Japanese internment camps, you know what I mean? You know, I was talking with some fella, um, you know, who, who grew up in San Francisco, and he was talking about, he, he, lived in, he lived in an Asian community, and when World War II hit, the entire community was deported, put in internment camps, all the Japanese people in that neighborhood. And it's just like, wow, you know, you, you, you don't know, you don't know them stories, you know. Um, another another big thing that I've been kind of like looking into is like, you know, the legacy of Asian, you know, Asian participation in the creation of Transcontinental Railroad. Did you know Asians were specifically excluded from the, the photograph that was taken when they met, you know. And there are descendants living in this country still today who can trace the lineage to where their, their ancestors were working on that railroad. And they still ain't getting acknowledged by these places that do these homages you know what i mean and that's just you know that's bureaucracy that's red tape that's just how it is you know what i mean but shouldn't be and the fact is is like all of us are from the same river you know all of us are from the same land and again i, th I think it's this kind of thing any anybody who tries to put a prohibition on what she's doing is a bond, a bond in this world wrong because it ain't stopping nothing. And if you let, and if you let somebody outside their their opinion stop what you're doing, or try to change who you are, or judge you, or um, minimize you, marginalize you, you know, that, that, that's 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 my that's my opinion. All right, Tammy, I ain't boring you. I ain't boring you none, am I? Oh, no. <laughs>
Now, I mean, it's, it's just basically, you know, back back in the back in the pre-war days, there were only two kind of records being put out. There, there was colored music, and there was there was race records, and there was hillbilly music, and both those categories were racial. And it's like, you know, at the same time, that was popular music, you know, for for a long time before jazz and these other forms started creeping in um, into the more mainstream, but. I think, you know, the, the, the very category of the current legacy that we live in in music is founded upon racial divisions, racial stereotypes, etc. And there is no reckoning going on within the music industry about the nature. You know, until the, to this day, you still, you, still see, you still see artists pilfering off the African-American community uh, without acknowledging it. White artists continue, by using black forms, continue to be raised higher than many African-American musicians. And I think that's, uh, you know, that, that's just a fact. This is just truth told. I'm just interested in not changing the narrative so much, but, you know, maybe realigning it. And, you know, I want to remember people are captivated by this crowd. You know, like if a, if a blue song, if a blue song starts getting off, you know, people are like, I gone to the crossroads. I can't tell. I, I, I don't give a damn about that crossroads narrative, man. I don't give a damn about it because at the same time, it it eclipses the facts of the reality, which is that no, the, these these it's, it's the same re, it's the same way that these cats try to pose that the Egyptians didn't build the pyramids. It's a certain amount of disrespect for those cultures to think that they couldn't do it themselves without some divine intervention or some d intervention off this off this. Uh, I, I, it may, maybe I'm overthinking it, but it's I think when it boils down to it, like the, these narratives are just not only false but they're detrimental to the perception of the music itself. I think the crossroads, the crossroads myth that gets pervaded out more and more. You know, I, I don't know who to blame for that, but that's one of the. I, th I think that's a that's a big inhibition for why blues ain't in the mainstream as well. It's it's not only a cliche, but a lot of people like don't care. You know what I mean? I, I think of you know Robert Johnson moved to. You know that whole story came from that he moved away. Somehow said he moved away, and all of a sudden he came back and knew how to play guitar. But the actual story, you know, the historians would actually say, you know, he probably, he probably moved to Arkansas, had a farm, had a gal. That gal died in childbirth and so did the child. You know what I mean? And he was trying to, you know, as far as I understand, he was trying to live his life. And he came back a completely changed man. You know, imagine going through all that stuff. I mean, maybe, you know, maybe you've been through, through something as heavy as that, you know. But imagine going through that when you're 24, 25 years old. You know what I mean? And, um... And also, may, you know, may, maybe that narrative is partially created because the reality itself is so tragic and terrible that we need to create these images and these stories to distract because talking about it straight on just is too difficult to speak of. You know, I, I, I love blues music and it's, it's one of these weird balances. I think Don Fleming does it really well, but, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you educate folks, re-educate folks? at the same time of entertainment, you know, like you can't, you can't lecture when you're, when you're on stage opening for James Hunter. At the same time, it's like you, there needs to be a, you know, there's a conversation about these songs uh, when it comes to how, you know, like I, I'm playing music, particularly my, my, my genre of music. I, I'm playing, I'm playing music where these musicians thrived and were oppressed under the era of Jim Crow. And, I, it's really hard for me to perceive the difficulties it would be to be in that kind of setting. You know, we talk about Charlie Patton playing white picnics and all this kind of stuff and being able to play for the white crowds, but these people would have murdered you if you if you if you didn't if you didn't keep them right. You know what I mean? If you if you weren't on their side about things, if you weren't willing to go in the back, you know, it's like, and I, it, it says something about the perseverance of the musicians back in the day as well. Um, to be able to have their records created and carried on for somebody like me in the 21st century, you know, um, to actually enjoy. But I think when you're listening to the records, unless the musician themselves is kind of talking about it explicitly within a song, you know, J.B. Lenoir has got Alabama Blues, Big, Big Bill Bruins has got White, Black, Brown. Um, you know, my, my favorite songs, Tom McClint, one of my favorite talking about racial conversations is Tom McClennan's Bottled Up and Go. Where he's got this line, I, I replace the line, and, and this might not be kosher, but you know, he's got this line where he's like, uh, I, "I replace it as somebody who's who's, who's felt, you know, I, I've, I've been called chinky and gooky my whole life by by people, you know, that I've grown up with, 
And so, like, when I seen that lyric, I say, Chinky and the white man playing seven up. Chinky beat the white man scared to pick it up. Apparently, when Tom McClennan sang that song, Big Bill, Big Bill Bruins, he remembers, you know, the story about playing, playing with Tom being like, I think you need to change that lyric tonight. You know what I mean? Like, Tommy didn't give a damn. Damn their eyes. And, you know, he, he'd be willing to get thrown out of a place. You know, his life threatened to play his music. And I think that that speaks also to just like, despite these restrictions, these musicians were going to do it. You know, it's really funny. You know, like I, I love Bo Carter. He's got banana in your fruit basket. You know, he's got all these double entente songs that are like pretty dirty. And the funny thing is like they're recording these songs at the same time in an era where, you know, you can you can literally be in prison for singing a lewd and lascivious song on the street you know and so you're dealing with these musicians who you know I'm, I'm a big fan of this dude named texas alexander like dude went to jail for singing you know a whoopee song something like that you know so it's like i think the the transition right now in the 21st century is more and more musicians because of these platforms such as tiktok or instagram or any of these places where you can build an audience outside of the normal means it also it also changes the, the the biology of what a musician is in so far as musicians look at themselves, you know, I don't know about blues players, but a lot of musicians look at themselves as content creators now. And I think the, the moving away from that because everybody's aspiring, I can't tell you, you know, I'm not really big on social media just in terms of like, I don't check my, you know, my messages and stuff like that. But it's strange to me because, you know, I'll have people message me just be like, please follow me back like i love you follow me back but it's like what's the what's the point of this whole of this whole game you know what i mean it's like it's like that this isn't why you should be playing the music or this my, my attention shouldn't matter to you and it's like it's not like a follow like following you means nothing you know what i mean like these these things that we standardize ourselves into thinking it means something follower counts listeners things like that um, it's really atomic. It's, it's like atomizing. It's like breaking down the flower, you know? It's like crushing the flower to see how the rose smells, you know? And when it comes to playing music, everybody's always trying to climb some pyramid, you know? You're, you're always looking for somebody higher up on the pyramid, you know? Los Angeles, you know, it's the devil's favorite town. This place knows it better than most places. And at the same time, I think I'm always just trying to get deeper and deeper into the bedrock and deeper and deeper closer to the people who are already down on the ground who look at that pyramid and say that ain't that ain't what this is about that, that ain't what playing music that ain't what the soul is about that ain't gonna be with me on my deathbed you know what i mean like the people who follow me on these platforms or wherever you know they ain't gonna be with me on my sick bed you know what i mean and i just think yeah i i just like more and more i engage with kind of the music industry itself is like the further and further i get away from wanting to operate by this climbing, you know, like I was saying, they, they try to, they try to, they try to create these, they try to create these, uh, you know, aspirations for, you, you know, they, they seduce you with terms like Grammys or stuff like that. Even my record label did it. And the truth is, is like, yo, once you, once you realize that there's 50,000 musicians in this country alone who are getting promised and uh, cajoled for the same exact reason, you realize it's just all, it's, it's all vanity. It's all, it's all just an exercise in vanity. But, and what I'm appreciative about blues music and blues music generally, mainly only blues music, is that you find people who ain't looking, a lot of the time you ain't finding people who are looking out for clout. They're just looking out for, they're just trying to find other people who know this feeling too. It just, you know, it's like, it's like that classic blues line, you know, some people say the worry blues ain't bad, but it must have not been the blues I had, you know? So I just, you know that that's kind of the deeper bonds to me. I'm get you know I get I get goosebumps trying to just think about it, man. You know, it's I think there there just needs to be a general change, and I think the legacy of music generally, but also history. I mean, this country, this country is like it's such a fascinating place. The historic the history here in this country is knee deep, and the fact is there's blood deep in this soil everywhere. I feel fully
guys, what'd you think of that? Um, we can watch me show you junky guitar. But very seldom do I get that opportunity. And the great thing about it is we got nothing to sell. We got no interest in the records. We just like the music. And, 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 and that's why I like my viewer base or subscriber base or whatever we were talking about. You heard Nat talking about, you know, you like me, I like you, I'll follow you if you follow me while well, we're all following ourselves down a pathway of ignorance most of the time. But listen, do me a favor. Go down below, listen to some of this music. And if you're going to be a capitalist for the last time or for the first time or whatever time, get a hold of this, download it, listen to it, and I think you're going to hear some of the things we talked about would not be confirmed. And, and, and they're going to ring a bell in you because, yeah, they're real. Uh, Nat, number one, thank you for spending time with Tammy. Number two, ta thank you for taking one of her guitars down the road and showing it places and people and things it has never seen before. And thank you so much for a real inside the person look at you, a great blues artist. Hey guys, I have another episode going on where you will see Nat play the Galliano Junk Pile uh, during a sound check uh, inside the concert I saw in September uh, in Los Angeles. So there will be a link up there. Click on that and listen to music. Hey, thanks for joining me today. I like this history and I like these social discussions more than you know, and they certainly benefit me in terms of what I'm doing outside of this channel. So give me a like and a subscribe. Don't forget, follow Nat and support him. There's not very many like him, and we want to keep these people, these people, whatever that means, around.